So, while Treg wanted to leave the auditorium, I have a few practical announcements. Today's sessions begin with a personal presentation by the speakers, followed by a Q&A session. You can ask the speakers your questions in two ways. First, you can simply raise your hand, and an organizer will bring you a microphone. And secondly, you can access our online Q&A tool, Slido, on your smartphones. Go to slido.com and enter our event code, ASIMP2016. Remember throughout the day to choose the correct auditorium. We strongly encourage you to actively <laughs> participate in our Q&A sessions and really challenge the speakers with any questions you might have. Furthermore, we have exciting prizes for the winners of today's two competitions. Best question asked on Slido and best picture posted on Instagram using our hashtag ASIMP2016. So, without further ado, let me welcome on stage the moderator of our first session and a good friend of our symposium, journalist and anchor at TV2 Business, Vibeke Dahl Bjørn. Hello everyone and um, thank you very much for having me back. It's my third year here at the Aarhus Symposium and I, uh, I always enjoy it a lot. Um, Mainly because it's, it's very easy for me, because you guys always ask the best questions. So uh, I would like to encourage you to do the same this year. Um, go to Slido, or even better, stand up and, and ask your questions when we reach the Q&A session. Because that's always the most interesting part about the, the sessions, when you uh, challenge and, and test the speakers. And, and I mean, it's, you actually you ask a lot of the questions that uh, we anchors don't dare to ask. So. Uh, Go, go right ahead, let's, let's go get him. Um, I also like the theme of this year, power, the art of power. We uh, often discuss this uh, uh, at uh, T2 Business, what is power, who's the most powerful businessman in Denmark right now. And um, I was actually a bit surprised about this speaker because I hadn't considered uh, power in this way. But when I, I thought about it, I mean, it's, it's obvious uh, that you would put uh, Bjarke Inges uh, on this uh, power power list, um, I read somewhere that he is architect famous, meaning that uh, maybe you wouldn't recognize him on the street, but you would be able to point out one of his buildings or uh, something something he made. I, I actually disagree. I think that uh, in Denmark he's uh, he's pretty famous, and you would recognize him on the street uh, because we're so proud of him here in Denmark, to have a countryman who's, uh, who's done so well for, him, for himself. But he's also famous abroad. He's, uh, he's 42 years old and he already turned his business from, from zero uh, to 250 employees. He's made several great landmarks already. He's currently building the new uh, Google headquarters, Googleplex. He's uh, building uh, the last of the new World Trade Centers. And, uh, he also made his first skyscraper, which I guess for an architect must be uh, somewhat of a, a, a special turning point in, in a career, I would guess so. But uh, it seems that uh, he's not done reaching for the sky yet. He has a lot of uh, big projects coming up. And um, actually, Rolling Stones magazine just uh, wrote about him recently, and I think they put it really well, because they said, Bjarke Ingels, the man building the future. I mean, come on, that's, that's pretty powerful. <laughs> so uh, with that, I think we should just please welcome Bjarke Engels to the stage. Thank you. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here in, uh, in Aarhus. Um, and uh, and, and it, is, it is very true, because I mean, uh, since... Um, since uh, I am an architect, uh, and since you, you don't typically uh, associate uh, architects with, uh, uh, with power, uh, I would say like you probably more likely associate architects with powerlessness. Uh, uh, I was thinking about like, how, how I could uh, make myself relevant uh, in this room. And, um, and I think maybe uh, you can say, you know, as architects, we, uh, we might not have the political power 
because we, we can't decide what needs to get, get done. And, and anyone who's ever followed any public debate about architecture can see that the, uh, th uh, things often get voted down and they end up not happening. Uh, um, so we don't have political power. We don't have financial power either because we can't pay for the things we do. Um, like the, uh, the skyscraper that we just c uh, completed in, uh, uh, in New York uh, is, uh, is, is worth uh, se several billion kroner. Um, and and that's, that's not the kind of change we, uh, we walk around with. So, um, so we don't have uh, financial power, but I think what we do have is that we have the power of our ideas. Um, that we, we, uh, we have the potential to put forward uh, ideas that can somehow be uh, the answer to the questions or the needs that the, that the, that the people walk around with. And, and, and with those examples, we can actually um, make, meaningful, uh, make a meaningful difference. So, so I'd like to talk with you about an idea we've been developing uh, in our office over the last uh, decade. Um, our office is called the BIG, um, uh, BIG Engels Group. Uh, I have uh, very uh, committed uh, colleagues, uh, and, um, and, and this, is, uh, this is our workspace. Uh, it's, a, it's a former Carlsberg factory, uh, and I think it's, it's kind of relevant because I mean, there's something interesting that quite often you see that you know, the, uh, the most successful museum in London is a former power plant. Um, the most successful park in New York uh, are former uh, train tracks, uh, the High Line. Uh, and some of the best uh, workspaces uh, are uh, former factories uh, that have been converted because they're not tailored for the purpose they have. They have a certain generosity. Uh, they have uh, big spans uh, for maximum freedom, uh, tall ceiling height so you can move big stuff around, uh, uh, like abundance of daylight because daylight is cheaper than electricity. So in that sense, they have um, some kind of infrastructural uh, raw attributes that can then suddenly become the perfect framework for a creative office. Um, and that leads me to this idea that we've been developing that we call social infrastructure, uh, which is like a term originally sort of coined, let's say, in the 60s, often um, referring to the, um, the, 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 the social um, uh, network in a community, the amount of kindergartens and nursery homes and medical centers. But we mean it much more literally um, infrastructural projects, raw pieces of public utility that have positive social and environmental uh, side effects. Um, and we all know that a piece of infrastructure like a bridge or a highway can have a negative impact uh, on its community. Um, we were asked to look at downtown Vancouver where Granville Bridge touches downtown and where People, it's like, it's really the, the center of the city, but except here because the trifog of the bridge had torn this uh, city block to pieces. Um, and, and we were asked to see if we could turn that into a successful neighborhood. So we started looking at the constraints. There was like some setbacks from the streets. There was a setback that you were not allowed to build uh, closer to, uh, uh, to touch the, the bridge. Actually, you were not allowed to even build as close as 30 meters to the bridge because the city wants to make sure that nobody looks into the traffic uh, on the bridge. Then there's a park where we can't cast any shadows. And finally, we're left with a tiny footprint of, uh, of 600 square meters, um, almost too small to build. But then we thought, if, if the distance to uh, the bridge has to do with a minimum distance from the home to the car, once we get 30 meters up in the air, we can actually grow the building back, uh, make it twice as big. Um, as you drive over the bridge, it feels as if someone is pulling a curtain aside, sort of welcome to Vancouver. Or, or imagine like a weed growing through the cracks in the pavement, and then it starts to blossom when it gets air and, uh, uh, and daylight. And then we try to turn the, you know, because like between the, the bridges, we can actually put shops, offices, uh, and spaces for work. And we try to turn the underside of the bridge into a positive. Uh, so we worked with uh, a lo uh, local uh, group of artists from Vancouver, including Rodney Graham, to turn the underside of the bridge into what we've called the Sistine's Chapel of Street Art. Uh, essentially an art gallery uh, turned upside down. Um, and, and suddenly uh, you'll find that the, what used to be the negative impact of the bridge is now becoming the character and the soul of this new neighborhood in, uh, in Vancouver. Um, also, uh, we all know that just like the Tate Modern, a piece of infrastructure from the past can get reinvented uh, as a piece of culture. 
Um, we did uh, the Danish Maritime Museum next to Hamler's castle, uh, Kronborg. Um, Korn Kronborg became a UNESCO World Heritage. Um, so they, the, the Maritime Museum used to be inside the castle. They had to kick it out. Uh, and they suggested, why don't you put it uh, in the dry dock where they used to build the ships? Um, and there was some kind of a, um, a dilemma because uh, uh, we weren't allowed to stick as much as a, a centimeter out of the ground to not block the view of the castle. Um, so we got the idea to, in a way, turn the dock inside out, to use the museum to preserve the dock. Uh, all we had to do was design uh, three bridges, one that connects, like stops the water from coming in, one that connects to the castle, and then, because we couldn't even put an elevator, there's a bridge that actually gently slopes down uh, and takes you into, uh, into the museum. Then you have this like, uh, journey through different kinds of spaces. Um, the architecture is very much the encounter between the lightness of the glass and the steel and the heritage and the heaviness of, uh, uh, of the concrete. Uh, you have an auditorium where the, uh, the seats for the grown-ups continue under the stage uh, and becomes an auditorium for children. You have the, the restaurant where you look through different layers of, uh, uh, of transparency. And not only the inside is now part of the cultural environment of Helsinor, um, also the dock itself has become like a great venue for acoustic music because you have the heavy walls and the instant reverberation and the open sky. Um, so suddenly like this like piece of decommissioned infrastructure is now part of the heart of the, uh, of the cultural life of, of Elsinore. I, I love this uh, image, it's almost like a diagram that you have, you know, above the horizon, the heritage, and below the horizon, the contemporary uh, life of, uh, of the city. This is this sort of inverse titanic moment. <laughs> So uh, working with the, uh, the Maritime Museum, uh, we started looking a lot into the maritime infrastructure and like one of the main sort of logistical infrastructures of our society is the infrastructure of uh, shipping logistics. Uh, and we found out that you can buy this, it's a, a 45 foot high cube container, it's roughly three meters tall, uh, almost uh, 15 meters long, and it's, um, uh, it's, it costs 2,000 euros in Rotterdam. At this point, it will have sailed a few times around uh, the Earth, but it's, uh, it's perfectly strong. It can, you can stack them uh, eight levels. Um, so we got the idea that maybe we could hijack the infrastructure of global shipping. Um, if we have nine of them, we have 300 square meters of uh, space. If we stack them uh, up to seven meters tall, just in two layers uh, on a barge, we can actually build them within the maritime uh, regulations. Uh, so we can actually uh, turn uh, these nine containers into the home for uh, 12 students. Uh, each of them get like roughly 25 square meters of, uh, of space. Uh, they have a, a shared roof deck, they have a, a, a green roof, and they have uh, a photovoltaic roof uh, where uh, four of the solar panels run a heat pump uh, in the floating element underneath it that, uh, that uh, has... Um, that extracts the, the heat from the, the sea and actually heats the entire uh, 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 12 uh, homes and all their uh, hot water uh, for free. Um, basically, we, we built it in a shipyard in Poland. We dragged it across the, the Baltic Sea. Um, it arrived uh, by boat uh, early morning uh, in, uh, in Copenhagen. Um, and essentially, for around 5,000 kroner, you can, uh, you can get a waterfront uh, piece of property, uh, 5,000 kroner per month. Uh, you can have uh, probably the coolest house you'll ever have uh, in your entire life uh, as a student, uh, looking straight uh, over the, the water. You, can, uh, you, you practically have free food, because if you have a fishing rod, you can just stick it out the window. <laughs> uh, also, the, the water is so clean that you can jump out the window uh, uh, into, uh, into the port of Copenhagen and climb back in. Um, so essentially, almost like taking this, this whole industry that comes from uh, the efficiency of, uh, of global logistics uh, and actually use those efficiencies to become the, the solution to uh, uh, the fact that you have a, a severe undersupply of, uh, of student housing in, in practically all university cities in, uh, uh, in Western Europe. Um, 
Also, um, a, a project that I think really captures the essence of social infrastructure is a building we are finishing right now in uh, Copenhagen that, that I think could become the landmark uh, of Copenhagen in the future. And it's not uh, a cultural palace. It's neither the opera nor the, the royal theater uh, nor the royal palace. Uh, it's a power plant that turns household waste into electricity and district heating. Uh, because these kind of waste to energy power plants, they work on an economy of scale. They have to be very, very large facilities. This is going to be the tallest and biggest building in Copenhagen. And we thought uh, it's going to be right next to the marina. It's going to replace the power plant you see in the background. Um, uh, right next to the Copenhagen Cable Park, where the locals go water skiing. And we thought, like, how can we make this in such a way that it doesn't just become like an, another ugly box that uh, like blocks the views and casts shadows on the neighbors. Um, and and, and we, we didn't just want to make it a cosmetic uh, exercise to make the power plant look pretty, uh, but rather like how could it really be materially different? And we got inspired by uh, the water skiers, because uh, as you probably know, Danes, we love to ski. We actually do have snow, uh, some winters more than others, but we have absolutely no mountains. Uh, but uh, we apparently have mountains of, uh, of trash. Um, because of the size of this power plant, we can actually... Isabel is the closest uh, ski slope we can get to from Copenhagen. It's a few hours by car. We can put two-thirds of the main slope of Isabel on the roof uh, of this building. So that's what we proposed. Imagine like a, a power plant that slopes uh, continually. Uh, it has uh, hiking paths, uh, pine trees. Um, Insanely, uh, we won the competition uh, based on, on this proposal. Uh, you know, so, so suddenly we had to uh, uh, you know, deliver. Um, and uh, you probably remember that uh, Denmark won zero medals in Sochi. Uh, we hope to actually uh, improve on those statistics. For, from 2017, we can actually practice uh, at home. Uh, and it's not only for skiers. It's, it's going to be a public park. You can hike. Uh, picnic, uh, enjoy the views of the otherwise flat city of, uh, uh, of Copenhagen. Um, it's going to have the tallest climbing wall in the world, 100 meters. Uh, um, and basically you can say like the diagram you saw in the beginning, which is like a diagram trying to, to look at our cities and buildings as man-made ecosystems, is very close to becoming complete here because not only do we harvest you know, uh, precipitation, uh, the water that falls on the building for the park, uh, natural daylight, uh, natural air flows, but also together with the city of Copenhagen, it forms a sort of metabolism that returns the waste uh, as a resource. Um, uh, these buildings are, 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 are like, these pictures are one year old. Um, but just to give you an idea here, I'm standing a third up on the hill. So this is not going to be like standing on the roof of a building, it's really going to be uh, like standing on the side of a, of a mountain, um, a, a more recent uh, uh, photo. So um, maybe just to sort of uh, explain how, how we could sort of uh, win a, a competition with, with such an unlikely proposal. It's basically because this is the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. Uh, the smoke that comes out of the chimney is completely non-toxic. Um, so, so that's like an amazing uh, aspect of green technology. Normally, you would want to be as far away as possible as you can be from a power plant because it's, it's bad for you. Uh, like here, you literally have clean mountain air uh, uh, on the roof of this building. And um, by, by making the building in this way, you don't have to like print all kinds of pamphlets and run uh, ad campaigns to explain what's, what's different about the, uh, this kind of clean technology. Uh, because it's blatantly obvious that this is a whole new paradigm and it sort of opens whole new avenues of thinking about public utilities uh, where they can actually come with positive social and environmental side effects. Um, to hammer this point uh, completely home, uh, we worked on the chimney uh, and we came up with the idea that the chimney could gradually uh, uh, accumulate steam uh, and then at regular intervals it could puff a gigantic steam ring. Um, so almost like changing the, the chimney from a symbol of all of our failures, uh, all the things that seep out into the atmosphere, it could become a celebration that every time we've uh, 
uh, reduce the emission of one t uh, ton of CO2 by replacing the former power plant. We, we celebrate it by puffing a gigantic smoke ring. Um, so um, uh, maybe just sort of, because this idea has been sort of escalated, uh, escalating a little bit uh, for us. And um, six years ago, I, I went to uh, uh, New York because we got invited to do uh, a building on the waterfront of, uh, of Manhattan. And um, we came up with, it, with the idea that it could be maybe like a hybrid between the density and the individual qualities and views of a skyscraper, but with the communal and social uh, qualities of a Danish courtyard, or essentially what could a court scraper look like. Um, so we placed the courtyard building on the waterfront of Manhattan, then we had to give it uh, Manhattan density, so we lifted up the northeast corner to 500 feet, but keeping uh, the southwest corner open, so you have like uh, sun uh, and views over the river. Uh, the result um, became this sort of striking silhouette that now sits on the on the waterfront of Manhattan, and uh, and that sort of uh, uh, two days ago got awarded the best uh, uh, skyscraper in the world in uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, two years. Um, and and basically, when you see it, yeah, yeah you can totally uh, clap. Uh, no, basically, when you when you see it from uh, from the from from the water or from the outside, you suspect that this is probably just some kind of crazy gesture, um, uh, because it does have a, a kind of striking uh, uh, geometry. Uh, you'll you'll notice that it has like this sort of warped uh, pyramid shape. You have like terraces sunken into the roof. You have balconies looking out over the uh, the courtyard. Um, the courtyard itself is actually. Uh, it has the same proportions as Central Park, only it's uh, 13,000 times smaller. Um, this sort of uh, like miniature uh, Central Park. And, and uh, we took sort of, uh, put all of the communal programs and wrapped them around the, the central courtyard. And the courtyard really becomes almost like this sort of little sanctuary in the middle of the city, like a small piece of Copenhagen that has now sort of invaded uh, uh, the waterfront of, uh, uh, of Manhattan. Uh, but basically, uh, the courtyard is not, even though you discover it as a surprise as you enter the building, the courtyard is the entire reason why the building looks the way it does. The, the fact that, you know, in one corner, it's the height of the handrail, on the other side, it's the height of a high-rise. Um, so also, it, it, it really has a, a, a quite strong presence on the, on the west side. This is the view when you land in, uh, in Newark. Uh, a view that uh, that makes the architect very happy when he uh, when he comes <laughs> home, um, but um, you can't talk about New York without also talking about Aarhus, uh, and uh, <laughs> and and I, and I must say that uh, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, Aarhus has really become uh, you know our main uh, playground in uh, uh, in Denmark. Uh, we, uh, uh, a few years ago, we uh, uh, teamed up with um, uh, a group of, uh, uh, of, of local uh, sort of uh, entrepreneurs, uh, including uh, Rune Kilten, who is sort of a, a very sort of active uh, citizen of, uh, of Aarhus, uh, to make a bid on making uh, this uh, uh, island number four, the last remaining island in the harbor, and uh, basin number seven. Uh, and we came up with this idea because, I mean, this is something that happens in all cities. The, the industrial port uh, uh, turns, uh, you know, some of the functions move away and, and it becomes city. And what has happened everywhere and, and a lot in Copenhagen is that you just built some office <coughs> buildings or you build some uh, apartment buildings. Uh, there's no real life. Uh, uh, the, the space around them is like leftover or it like becomes like mildly privatized. Um, so what we tried here was to come up with an idea and we suggested this to uh, the city of Aarhus that we would design all of the public space and all the public functions first, and we would build them first, and then the buildings would come uh, later. And, and we presented this idea without having a fixed design, and then together with the city of Aarhus, we, we, uh, we came up with a plan. And, uh, and one of them was, instead of always having these like endless uh, crane tracks of, uh, of keys, um, we would actually create this sort of undulating promenade that would sort of invade, uh, go deep into land and go deep into the harbor and, and back again. Uh, and we would use this promenade to sort of organize all of the public programs. So uh, we would have um, 
the new harbor bath uh, that's being uh, built in, uh, in Aarhus, we would set up a, a string of pearls of little like restaurants and cafes that would mean that you would actually uh, walk, uh, you'll be able to like walk all the way out, uh, also like sheltered a little bit from the wind uh, before the buildings come. There'll be a theater and finally these uh, bathhouses that people can buy or rent uh, to have like a little uh, outpost uh, in the middle of the, of the port. And then the, the buildings would come uh, afterwards and the building footprints, instead of the buildings shaping the, the urban space, the urban space actually shapes the buildings. We also uh, lower the buildings so that we ensure that daylight uh, uh, comes to everywhere. And then actually to ensure the public nature of the, uh, of the urban realm, we made sure that all of the buildings have a private courtyard space because the beauty, like sometimes, in the idea that everything has to be public, then suddenly you start privatizing the public space by actually providing the homes with their little uh, courtyards, we can ensure that the public realm becomes uh, really public. Um, so basically, this is sort of the, 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 the general DNA, like all of the, uh, the space uh, around the little pavilions, uh, the harbor bath extending into the, the port. Um, and then only two of the buildings become bigger than the others, it's the, the one closest to the, the harbor, the active port, where we use the, 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 the volume of the building to protect the rest of the neighborhood from the noise from the active port. And then finally, towards the, uh, the, the train tracks and, and the cars, again, uh, uh, a taller building to protect the, uh, the neighborhood from, uh, from the noise. Um, and then basically, this was, uh, was our idea. You can see we didn't really design uh, the buildings yet, but we designed, it, uh, designed everything between them. Uh, and it's actually sort of uh, uh, happening uh, right now. We, uh, we designed the, uh, the harbor bath. You can see like a series of pools, uh, a big wooden floating deck, a wooden promenade that is actually fully public. So you can walk around, uh, walk out in the middle uh, of the port. You have the diving pool where the, the divers and the people promenading will uh, be at roughly the same height, uh, say hello to each other. Um, a big sort of lap pool. Uh, and, and then a series of, uh, of thermal baths underneath this elevated uh, promenade where you can sit and chill and enjoy uh, uh, the view uh, of the port from, uh, from your sauna, uh, sit, sit in the cozy warmth and look out at the, at the freezing birds. Um, the, 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 the promenade remains uh, public uh, 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 throughout the day. We also have a small beach re recreating the, the beach bar that has been there uh, uh, in, in the last couple of years, uh, but this time floating uh, in the port. It's, it's on a construction. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they are working hard to figure out uh, how to put it together. Uh, and, uh, and in addition, you know, then like, there's a series of like, little pavilions uh, that make sure that as you walk out, there'll be like, restaurants and, uh, and liveliness. Uh, the last uh, sort of uh, curl on the tail of the harbor bath becomes the theater. Uh, the theater that sort of opened up towards the, the water, this sort of a, a David Lynch-esque uh, atmosphere looking out over uh, uh, the city. Um, and then finally, of course, uh, at the end uh, of the pier, uh, Aarhus, uh, the first building that we're building, um, that uh, in a way like a sort of a, uh, a Danish uh, a twin uh, of, uh, uh, of, of some of the ideas we developed in New York, uh, we came up with this idea of you know, making sure that we have a series of different houses, canal houses that actually sit with their feet in the water uh, towards the canal and, and uh, three. Uh, a series of like s s special uh, sort of uh, maritime related uh, homes that actually open up to, uh, to the pier. And finally, uh, the apartments with the terraces uh, uh, on top, creating this sort of, uh, uh, and here you have the bath houses that are these little like sort of uh, almost like allotment uh, uh, homes uh, overlooking uh, the water. Um, and, and essentially, we try to sort of really create this, uh, this building that almost feels at home uh, in the port. Here you see this sort of almost like Vietnamese rice field uh, landscape of, of, uh, of large terraces, the communal courtyard that actually peeks out uh, uh, in the corner and uh, looks out over the, uh, the promenade. So, um, and, and, and actually sort of, um, we're trying to sort of uh, continue these principles. We, uh, together with uh, Rune Kilten and, uh, and Slet, uh, a local, uh, like really talented uh, Aarhus architect, we've put in a proposal of how to maybe uh, complete the, this master plan. Uh, but, but essentially, again, this idea of, of, of trying to take these sort of converted 
industrial areas and, and turn them into the framework uh, of the cultural life of, uh, of today. So from Aarhus, there's only one logical place to uh, conclude. Uh, that's back in uh, New York. Um, I moved to New York six years ago uh, to, to uh, create the, the, the court scraper. And um, after I'd been there for like two or three years, um, Hurricane Sandy came uh, and wiped out uh, all of Lower Manhattan. And according to a cartoonist from the New Yorker, uh, it gave rise to a whole new neighborhood in, uh, in New York. Um, but basically, after Sandy, everybody was sort of uh, anxious to, uh, to not have it happen again. So we got invited by the city of New York to look at how we could do uh, all of the necessary flood protection for Manhattan in such a way uh, that uh, it wouldn't become a seawall that would segregate the life of the city from the water around it. Uh, and we looked at the, at the High Line, um, and the High Line is really the most popular park in, uh, in New York, only superseded by Central Park. And it is basically former train tracks that have now been given you know, environmental and, uh, and social programs. So we thought, what if we can actually design all of the necessary resiliency infrastructure, all of the necessary flood protection for Manhattan in such a way that we don't have to wait until it shuts down before it becomes nice. What if we could actually design it from the beginning with positive premeditated social and environmental side effects? And when you look at, uh, at New York, uh, it has very much been shaped uh, by the clash of these two giants. Uh, on one hand, it's Robert Moses. Uh, he was also known as the power broker. He was a very, very powerful public servant. He created a lot of the, the, the big public works of New York, most of the highways, most of the public parks, uh, most of the public housing projects, uh, like necessary projects, but often with a devastating impact on the local community. At some point, he tried to run the Trans-Manhattan Highway through uh, Greenwich Village, uh, and he encountered resistance from Jane Jacobs, uh, who was living in, in the village, and she rallied the whole local community, and in a sort of David Goliath moment, she defeated the plans and saved the village. So we thought, what if the dry line, uh, as we've called uh, uh, this project to protect Manhattan or keep Manhattan dry the next time a Sandy comes, what if the dry line could be conceived as the love child of Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs? Um, because to resist an incoming flood, you need 10 miles of sort of coordinated hard engineering, but to make it socially su successful, it needs to happen in a close dialogue with uh, you know, the communities uh, that actually inhabit the waterfront. So we presented a strategy uh, uh, to the city of New York, uh, similar to the one we, uh, uh, we developed uh, with, uh, with uh, Aarhus for Eufia, that we wouldn't give them a, a final proposal, but we would actually, we identified who are we gonna work with and how are we gonna use their feedback to actually uh, create the necessary flood protection uh, for Manhattan. So I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, finish by showing you a, a film we've made um, where you can see the different uh, uh, people from the communities that we worked with. You can hear their experience from Sandy and you can hear their concerns and their dreams for their future uh, uh, waterfront uh, and see what it, uh, what it will look like. coming in with the, the wind and the tide lining up perfectly to give us 14 foot tides <laughs> instead of 8 foot. The most shocking part of uh, Hurricane Sandy was the fact that it, it, uh, it exceeded expectations. I think the sheer magnitude of it caught a lot of people off guard. When Hurricane Sandy came, we were not prepared at all. I mean, not even the slightest. Yeah, it was like an alien invasion of water. And not the good kind of water. So yeah, I mean, it came right in front where the, there's literally boats on 14th Street floating in front of our in front of our window. We had a sub-basement level office, a block from here, and it was totally covered in water for two days. So we lost everything, everything. We're really concerned about another storm and the flooding that's possible, and we think that the next time it's going to come even further inland. I'd like to see some type of flood protection in this area. Um, going to happen. Um, more vulnerable, obviously, being closer to the water. Something that just brings, like, uh, 
more walks, different walks of life. You know, uh, another escape from the busyness and the hustle and bustle. So uh, we're actually uh, right now um, designing the first two thirds uh, uh, of the Big U. This idea of an, an enhanced and improved waterfront that uh, will be the uh, the, the same uh, uh, waterfront that actually keeps the city dry the next time uh, uh, Sandy comes. And, and I think it's maybe a good uh, a good place to sort of maybe return to this idea of the power of uh, uh, of ideas, because you can say as um. Uh, like normally you say that uh, in um, naturally emerging leadership in, uh, in a group, any group, happens with uh, the one in the group who manages better than anyone else to capture uh, the accumulated concerns and aspirations and, and dreams and desires of, of everybody in the group. Uh, and, and people sort of gather around uh, uh, this, uh, this vision. And you can say as an, as an architect, uh, we, we can't say uh, that we're going to make, uh, you know, a billion dollar power plant uh, with a ski slope on the roof. Uh, we have to wait until someone actually wants to make uh, a power plant or needs to have a power plant. And then we can sort of, uh, you know, cease uh, that necessity. Uh, you know, we, we have to wait until someone says that we have to uh, protect Manhattan from, uh, uh, from the next uh, uh, Sandy. And then we can sort of uh, seize that utility uh, and that necessity and use it as a vehicle to sort of advance uh, some of our more uh, ideological uh, uh, sort of uh, programs. So you can say like, um, and that's maybe where the, the power of, uh, of idea comes in and then that, that's maybe where the, the idea of social infrastructure is interesting maybe uh, beyond the realm of architecture and, and architecture and, and, and city building uh, is that um, I think there's a lot of power uh, in harnessing the power of the, the aspects of of life or society that is um, you know, use the, 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 the practical uh, and use it as a vehicle for the, for the let's say, the ideological uh, and use, um, you know, you, you know, take, harness the power of the necessity and the things that have to be done uh, and use it as a vehicle for all of the things that would, would be wonderful to create uh, and that we actually dream about. Well, uh, thank you very much, Bjarke. 
I think he just illustrated why he is uh, the man building the future. It's very impressive. Although it's a tough crowd. I mean, they didn't even applaud your skyscraper winning. So uh, Yeah, I tell you what. <laughs> let's see what kind of, uh, of mean questions they can come up with. I still have to say, we have uh, 30 minutes of, uh, of Q&A now. So you can still ask questions to Bjarke, either by, either by raising a hand or by going to uh, slido.com, where you can also... Uh, vote on the on the questions that uh, that's already been uh, been asked, um, but I think we should just uh, jump right into it. Um, the the favorite question, so so to speak, uh, right now is is this one: um, Do you believe that uh, modern architecture is killing national identity? Um, everything is is made from glass and steel. How do how do we empower uh, national identity? What's your thought on that? Um, uh, I mean. I, I do think that, I mean, obviously there has been a, a great tendency, also when I, when I started studying architecture, um, everybody would ask me when they heard, ah, oh, you're studying architecture, like, can you explain why are all modern buildings so boring? Uh, whereas, you know, when you look at some of the, the structures that have been preserved from the past, you know, like, they have uh, all kinds of ornaments, uh, and, you know, like, the old skyscrapers in New York, they have gargoyles uh, that spew out the... Uh, water and stuff. So, so, so of course, in, in that context, uh, and, and and also like modernism came with uh, with this idea of uh, of modern engineering that uh, you know where we used to rely on the windows for daylight. Suddenly we have electric lights, so we didn't really need the windows so much. We used to rely on the thickness of the walls. Uh, to keep a, a comfortable temperature, but now we had central heating and air conditioning. We used to rely on uh, on opening uh, on openings to get ventilation. Now we could actually have mechanical ventilation. So suddenly the the architecture didn't do what it used to do, and and it and it ended up just becoming like a boring container of space with a gas guzzling machine room full of machines that would keep it alive. Um, and uh, and and that did result in a, in buildings starting to look the same everywhere. Um, and I think in a way what what we're trying to do is that, um, and, and that's why they called modernism the international style, because building really did look the same everywhere. Um, so I think what we're trying to do is, uh, and, and, I, and I hope you can see from the projects we're doing, is that uh, by not having this sort of universal answer that fits everything, but by, by insisting that in each and every case, uh, there is a unique set of ingredients there is a unique set of problems that need to be solved. There's a unique set of uh, potentials that you can unfold. Uh, there is um, a unique climate, a unique culture. Uh, and, and using those elements, uh, we, we use those elements as the driving force uh, of the design. And that's why buildings start looking uh, different, uh, not because, no, not just for fun, uh, for the sake of looking different, but because they perform differently uh, in each and every case. But you could argue that maybe some of, of the things that you're doing, that you're showing us, looks a little bit the same. I mean, your, your skyscraper has the, the courtyard center. You're planning on doing the same with the building here in Aarhus. I mean, that, that's not very uh, Aarhus identical than if, if, if it's the same as, as the one in Manhattan, is it? No, but I, th I think they have uh, e each thing, but actually, like, if, I mean, if, if you, if you want to look at it like that, then, like, you know, most buildings have uh, red brick in all of Europe, right? So uh, that's not very uh, unique. So, so in that sense, I think it's more about ceasing, because, I mean, I think, um, you know, actually, at some point, Wolf Morgenthaler, they invited me to... Uh, babysit uh, the Wolf Morgenthaler strip because they went on holiday over the summer. Uh, so I took the chance and to make... And you didn't have anything else to do, so why yeah, not? Yeah, I didn't have anything else to do. Uh, I, you know, I, I always wanted to be a, a cartoonist. So then I actually decided to, uh, uh, you know, abuse my power and only make strips about architecture. Uh, and, and one of them that I did uh, was, uh, you know, like two, uh, two images next to each other. One was just... Uh, one was called Copenhagen, and you see like a series of five-story buildings, and then you have, you know, uh, with the Kirgetorn with the with the spiral, and you have the stock exchange with the dragons, and you had like all the different spires, uh, the round tower with the observatory at the top, and then the other one was like the same five-story buildings and nothing else, saying Copenhagen if everybody followed the rules, because because at the end of the day, uh, identity is just as much about. What, what, uh, what brings us together, it's actually uh, also very much about all the exceptions. 
And I think the landmarks in any city that makes you feel that you are in Copenhagen or that you are in, uh, in Aarhus uh, are often the exceptions to the rule rather than the rule itself. Uh, and I think therefore it is important for a city to, uh, to have both. Uh, and I think identity is, uh, it's never uh, a done deal because like, your identity is only fixed when you're dead. Uh, uh, if you are alive and any city is alive, uh, its, its identity will always transform. And if, when you think about some of the things that people are really proud of in Aarhus, it's for instance the, uh, the, the rainbow halo uh, of uh, Olaf Eliasson on, on Aarhus. Uh, and 10 years ago, it wasn't here. And, and, and wouldn't it be depressing if Aarhus didn't have that uh, today, just because everything had to fit in with a mold that was established uh, uh, before uh, most people here were born? But, but it brings me to, to think about something that you just said, that you said, Power is essentially about having the visions. I mean, at least when you're talking architecture, and and visions, uh, being able to think out something new and unique. Are you ever afraid that you will lose your ability to to be visionary because that would mean a loss of power? Um, I, I mean, it's 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 funny. Um, I mean, I think it it solves itself because uh, um, I think what happens. Also, also, like, uh, you know, when I started uh, my company 16 years ago, uh, there was like a, a huge uh, disconnect between all the things that, uh, you know, I could do with if anyone would let me uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and what people would actually let me do, right? So, uh, and, and I think the, the way that you navigate uh, this is that uh, as, as certain things uh, happen for you, uh, you get... Uh, you get satiated uh, with, like certain appetites actually gets uh, fulfilled or satiated, uh, and it actually leaves room for um, uh, a cra craving for, for something else. And, and I think as, as, as long as you have that craving, as long as you don't, uh, you know, e endlessly repeat some, something because it was a, an early success, um, and, and, I th and I think, you know, I, I'm not afraid of, of being stuck in that because um, there's always this appetite to take it one step further. And I think maybe, maybe one thing that's important if you, if you look at the relationship between uh, the New York building and, uh, and the Aarhus building, uh, I would say arguably they are like really sort of, uh, uh, sort of materially different, but clearly they are related. You can say that the, the, the New York uh, building is almost like the, the American uncle uh, of the sort of Aarhus uh, nephew. And in a way, when and actually, what happened when we were building uh, the the New York building, uh, uh, before we we had the the warped roof uh, that makes it like so sharp and smooth, uh, we actually had the floors, and we were looking at it and we thought like, fuck, maybe we should have just left it uh, with these terraces uh, like rice fields. That looks amazing. Uh, and then uh, happily, uh, we got the uh, uh, the chance to to realize that dream. And that in that sense, every every idea you ma put forward. Has a, has spin-offs that actually uh, gives birth to, uh, to to new ideas that are maybe not entirely different, but they're like a, a distant uh, cousin or uh, 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 some kind of a nephew of uh, of what came before. So it's essentially it's about staying hungry, which I think I mean a, a lot of um, a lot of the participants here are, are asking this question: uh, Is creativity is that taught or is it uh, one? Is one uh, born with it? I mean, did you just uh, arrive to this world uh, always hungry for new things, or did you did they teach it to you at school? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think uh, I think at the end of the day, but this is this is more like sort of a basic uh, human belief. I mean, I I, I was uh, I have a little brother who's uh, 11 years younger than me, and I have a big sister. Uh, but I, I was at the birth uh, of my little brother, so I was standing uh, uh, in. The, uh, in the birth room, uh, watching my uh, little brother appear. Uh, Very scary. <laughs> uh, exactly, and I was the first uh, guy to uh, hold him, and I and I brought him up to uh, to my mom, and um, and it was clear to me that he had he already had the personality that he has, uh, you know, from day one, from uh, like the first second, uh, and I think so. In that sense, I think what what you are born with, the nature that you are born with, is uh, is your truth. And uh, the nurture you get, and the education you get, the, the the cultivation you get, is what enables you to express that truth as 
as clearly or, or not uh, as you can. So in that sense, I, th I think what you have to offer the world, you're, you're, you're born with, uh, but the, to the extent to which you get to express it uh, clearly is, uh, is, is up for uh, you know, your parents and your society to, to enable or inhibit. But what, but what would be your advice then uh, for someone in here maybe wanting to fulfill their, their, their great potential i mean, did you do anything yourself? You, you say it's uh, about uh, the surrounding society, but but you must have done something yourself. Yeah, I mean, this becomes like a. It, it, it sounds uh, almost like, a, like like cliches, but I mean, I think one of them is, uh, um, you know, I, I I started on the architecture school a little bit by accident because I wanted to be a cartoonist. That's why the Wolf Morgenthaler thing was very important. Uh, but um, uh, and it was because I didn't have a better plan. Uh, and it, it, you know, it was the art academy. Uh, I would definitely you could draw. Yeah, you know, I, I, I had, I'd drawn people and horses and helicopters and cars exploding or whatever. But I never do buildings or landscapes. So I thought, you know, I'll spend a few years like getting good at drawing the backgrounds, and then I can can focus on the foreground uh, again. But then I got s obsessed with architecture in the in the process. But but I think in the beginning it was very frustrating, uh, and it was because uh, I think in a way I was trying to. Uh, uh, I was, I was, I was, because I didn't have any kind of premeditated ideas about architecture. Uh, everything seemed so alien, and it was kind of it's pe people that know architects. It can be a quite uniform uh, culture, uh, and you know, like a very specific type. It's not like I'm uh, completely changing the, the 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 black wardrobe of, uh, of architects myself, <laughs> but, uh, but 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 in a way. Um, then in a way, like I think th the moments where I was like getting in the wrong direction, when I was like too much trying to assume what I assumed to be the mindset of how you make architecture, uh, and I think when the, the, the breakthroughs I had was when I, when I, when I reconciled my architecture personality with my own personality, uh, instead of like putting on uh, the hat of being now I'm an architect now I think like an architect. It's like uh, if I would remain the same person uh, in my work as I am in my uh, in my personal life, uh, it was much more powerful because it was much more true, and what came out was much more exciting. And I think it's when you try to to behave the way and to think the way that 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 you assume is the is the norm, that then maybe it starts becoming predictable and uninteresting, and uh, and also uninteresting for yourself. Okay. Um, a question here um, says, uh, what project or, uh, or building have made you feel the most powerful? I'm assuming it's one that you built. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I, I must say, uh, l lately I, uh, I, I walked on the roof of, uh, of, the, um, of Amar Barge, or the powder plant, as Wired Magazine called it. And um, my concern was a little bit, because at the end of the day, we put a ski slope on the roof of a building. But, but when you walk uh, up that, uh, that hill, it really feels like standing on the side of a mountain. Uh, and there's no fear that this is not like a real uh, uh, ski slope. It is, it's like a, a piece of Danish bedrock that we have created from scratch. Uh, and uh, uh, and that, uh, that felt pretty <laughs> epic. Hell yeah, I built a mountain. <laughs> Um, what's your approach to uh, to leadership? As I said in uh, the introduction, you now have a, a company of, of around 250 uh, employees. Um, do you consider yourself a leader? I mean, or does the the creative uh, person always always wins? Uh, yeah, but yeah, but I, I would say like uh, for, for sure, and I, and I think maybe maybe two aspects to that uh, question. First of all, I think leadership. One of the most important aspects of leadership is that you actually set the tone of your company. So just like you know, children learn how they, they don't do what their parents say, they do what their parents do. Uh, and I think it's the same in a company that uh, uh, you know, people, people behave uh, the way that their leadership uh, behaves. Uh, and in that sense, you as a, as a leader, you have an amazing power to set uh, a tone uh, and a way of working together uh, that is either going to create a, a, a wonderful workplace or it can create like a, a terrible environment. And, and before I started my own company, I was working for my favorite architect, uh, 
uh, a man called Rem Kohlhaas, who still is my favorite architect. Uh, but uh, the work environment was simply non-conducive to my personal happiness. So uh, I decided, uh, you know, also I felt like I could do it uh, myself, and, but, but also I really was conscious about making sure that I end up creating the place where I want to work myself. Um, so that's, that's one thing, like maybe this idea of set, setting the tone or setting the example. And then, and then I think secondly, big, uh, and also I'm not the CEO of big, I'm sort of the creative director. Um, um, so we have a, a, you know, a, a sober, reliable uh, business, uh, businesswoman a woman, yeah, Sheila. Uh, in, in charge of, uh, of our company. Um, but um, so I'm like the, the, the creative leader and it's the way we make decisions and the way we, we design our buildings is not, uh, it's not a democracy because we never vote. Uh, and it's not a dictatorship because it's not just because I say so. Uh, it is a meritocracy, if you like, in the sense that the ideas that merit the most uh, are the ideas that we end up pursuing. Uh, and you can say, in, it's not necessarily my job to come up with the best idea or the most brilliant idea, although I love it uh, when uh, I actually uh, come up with it. But, uh, but it's my job to make sure that it's the greatest idea that uh, we end up pursuing and that it ends up getting built. Uh, and I think in that sense, our process is so much about uh, constantly reiterating uh, what are the design criteria uh, that we're dealing with, what is the, the biggest problem we have to solve, what is the greatest potential we can unfold. Uh, and by constantly reiterating that, almost like by constantly narrating the design as we go along, uh, we constantly fine-tune the logic behind what we're doing and we, we constantly um, fine-tune it so that not only I but everybody on the team and actually all of our consultants and even our collaborators and, and the clients uh, are empowered with the knowledge of why it is we're doing what we're doing. So in that sense, it, at the end of the day, the more refined the logic of what we do uh, is, is refined, the more people on their own are capable and empowered to proactively propose things because they know uh, what we're going for. It's not just like a lot of executive morons waiting for uh, the leader to say something. Because like at the end, we're all experts of the project because we constantly uh, reiterate what it's all about. So that's your take on, on how to empower others? Yeah, yeah for, sure, for sure, with, with information. And because like, I think maybe in some, in some fields, there's a f certain fear that the uh, if you're too great of the teacher, then it, it eventually the student is gonna surpass the master. Uh, but you know, it's it's obviously more fun to work with uh, with the uh, Jedi's than it uh, it is to work with Padawans. <laughs> uh, it totally lost me. I'm sorry. I, yeah. I never watched the movies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm hoping someone else got it. <laughs> um, actually, let, let's just jump in right into the next question. That's. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit different, but it's fun. Uh, would you design Trump's Mexico wall? And if so, how would it look? <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think that wall is ever going to happen. Uh, I, I, I hope uh, it's never going to happen. And I, and I hope that he's not going to be the president of the United States. Okay. <laughs> but do you ever, I mean, uh, do you ever have uh, a jobs, tasks that you actually have a hard time taking on? But, I mean, you have to get some money in the bank by the end of the day. Yeah, but I mean, I, th I think at the end of the day, you know, I, I, think, I think we're pretty uh, fortunate uh, on that aspect. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's, uh, there's also actually two answers to that question. Because I mean, we have said no uh, a few times. Um, but it was, it was mostly, you know, like at some point we were actually doing a photovoltaics laboratory in uh, Korea. And then because of like some fluctuations in the market, uh, the same corporation. Uh, turned it into a place where they would do the robot guidance for missiles. And then we said, you know, we, we're not going to make an arms factory. And, and they were like completely fine, so we get it. You're excused. Uh, but, um, uh, and then of course we have in the past worked for, uh, you know, we, we won the competition to design the National uh, Library of Kazakhstan, uh, which is not like the most celebrated democracy uh, uh, on the planet. <laughs> Uh, but, but there my thinking was that uh, at the end of the day, are we making a positive impact with this project? Will the citizens of Kazakhstan be better off by having um, 
you know, an amazing public li library, uh, you know, only the way that we could do it. Um, and my answer to that question was this, and therefore I said, we're, we're totally going to do it, and we're going to give them the most amazing uh, national library they've, uh, they've ever seen. And, I, and actually, like, I was also thinking about, like, a lot of the, a lot of the, the buildings and the institutions that are the, the foundation of, uh, of, of, of Danish democracy, which is essentially uh, what's called the Inskrænkede Monarchy, uh, a limited uh, monarchy, were actually built by kings. Uh, and then eventually they informed uh, the public so much that they became so well educated that eventually they, they asked for the power and, and the king voluntarily gave it over uh, with a little bit of pressure. But that's why we still have a king and that's why actually I love the idea of kingdoms. It's just like all the kingdoms are the ones where the ruler uh, gave up power freely and the ones that don't are the ones where they had to cut his hair off uh, before uh, he would surrender. Um, so, um, so, so, so that was that was my thinking. What, what we came to as a conclusion was that it's simply impossible to act in certain places, uh, and eventually, um, uh, uh, we, we were like asked for bribes all the time. Uh, in every time you were alone, you almost had to try to not be alone in the room with anyone from the president's office, because as soon as the door closed, they started asking <laughs> for money, and it's like you know uh, we can't do it. Uh, we can't do it. Um, and eventually, we lost the job to. Uh, um, to another uh, to another contractor, so um, but I, but I think I, I wouldn't design uh, uh, I wouldn't design uh, Trump's wall uh, for specific reasons, but uh, but I do think that it is important that not just uh, the little cultural gems uh, like the uh, the concert halls uh, and the, and you know the the, the universities deserve architecture. It should also be, uh, you know, the, the factories and the, and the highways and the train stations and like uh, the, the industrials, the power plants, the places where we deal with our trash and, and the sort of the, the back of house uh, of our cities. They also deserve architecture and there's a huge potential uh, in actually taking those, those resources and also uh, getting the maximum out of them. That, that actually leads to uh, another question I think we should just uh, take. Um, as power comes along with uh, responsibility, in addition to, uh, to fancy uh, architecture, what's your take on, on building you know, new living space, for example, the socially uh, unadvantaged? I mean, you did your student buildings, but uh, I heard that some of the apartments in the Aarhus building is, is sold for, I mean, lots and lots of millions already. So, so do you, how do you honor that, that responsibility that comes with your job? No, but I, but I think we, we I think we again like because we uh, we, we do like for like the the via the the warped pyramid uh, on the Manhattan skyline, 20% of the homes are affordable, uh, and uh, so they are like um, uh, you you can get a studio uh, in. Uh, do you put that in as a demand when you when no, you're no, doing the building? This was uh, this was the city, and I and I think in general, you know, I can't tell a client, you know, like you should not make money on this project. What I what I can't uh, what I can do is try to make it as uh, um, in a, in a way as successful as, as possible on, on all uh, uh, on all metrics, uh, and I think um, uh, like the the student housing uh, urban rigor, if uh, if Aarhus has any available uh, 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 water area, uh, urban rigor should definitely help you with <laughs> with your student uh, home issues. Uh, actually, the the two projects uh, apart from the power plant. Uh, like this is like it's, it's the absurdity uh, uh, of our situation. Like the two projects, the three projects we're doing in uh, uh, in Copenhagen is a power plant that turns trash into electricity. Uh, it's uh, uh, social housing uh, in Norvest, and it's uh, student houses on uh, uh, on the train tracks. So, so in that sense, we are almost exclusively working with uh, the projects that that are never architecture, uh, and uh, and of course there there's a there's a huge potential. It's a little bit harder. Uh, wh when you have less resources to make something out of the ordinary, uh, but but if you can do it, the impact is uh, uh, is going to be so much greater. Okay. And I also think we're like with the power plant, we are raising the bar, because you would have to, you you will have a harder time arguing for doing just a big crappy power plant in the future if you can point at Copenhagen and say, well, in Copenhagen they ski on their power plants. Uh, you know, why is this just a dumb box? You true, know? true. But you actually said a couple of times during your presentation that you, you may have power, but you don't have political power. You don't have the decisive power in the end. Is that ever frustrating? I mean, sitting there with all your drawings and your sketches and, 
you know, knowing this could be great, this could be, I, I would win a new award for this, and then you get, I mean, someone else get picked instead. I, isn't that frustrating? It's terrible. <laughs> it's such a, you know, I also like to, uh, um, I mean, we lose so many uh, competitions, and uh, it, is, uh, it is a disaster, actually. Uh, uh, but, but, um, but, but, you know, in, in a way, uh, how do you keep yeah. up the spirits and, and I mean with your employees where they've spent so many hours uh, it's like the energizer bunny like the do a sail canine you just have to keep keep, keep going, going. <laughs> like, uh, or like this sort of tumble uh, tumble cup uh, for babies that just keeps uh, keeps getting up uh, every guy in time and gets knocked over no, but, but I think uh, it's it's such a slow uh, profession architecture um, you know, like the, the building we did uh, uh, on, on the west side, it, it's taken seven years and everything has been like maximum speed. Um, and uh, so, th so therefore, in the process, you're working on so many projects at the same time and they move at different speeds. Um, so you just have to say, you know, damn it, and then uh, focus on the next thing. Uh, and then maybe some of the some of the DNA that uh, some of the um, the thoughts the ideas that were developed can maybe resurrect uh, uh, in another form in another project. Uh, and and I and I think maybe it's a good um, I think maybe this probably also transcends architecture. That, that's why also we we never make a project with the purpose of winning. So we'll never make a choice, sort of yeah. But if we do this, we'll probably win. Like it's more like sort of what is the most amazing thing we can do here. Of course, it has to be fully realistic, and we have to know that we can deliver it. But you know, what would be the most game-changing thing to do in this case? And that's what we pursue. Because we, if you make all these like tactical compromises, then uh, if you win, you're stuck in the next five years building it. Uh, maybe not. You know, it's going to be five years where you could have done something else, something more. Uh, you know, elevating. Uh, and if you lose then you really lose because then you did like a shitty uh, tactical uh, sort of compromise uh, and you didn't even win. So you, you didn't even develop anything uh, interesting. Whereas if you do something amazing, if you win, you'll get to build it. And if you lose, at least you did something amazing. So you have to live with it for a long time. <laughs> um, this question I think is also uh, really interesting. What kind of considerations did you have in uh, designing this new World Trade Center, the, the last one of the new towers? Uh, considering how sensitive a subject 9/11 is, yeah, I mean, I, of course, that was uh, that was like a, a very daunting. Um, uh, there's actually an interesting little curl to the story because, like, uh, uh, in Kazakhstan, after two years, we finished the foundations. Uh, we we, had, we were above ground. Uh, we had had uh, like 10 people in Kazakhstan for like a year. It was a complete nightmare. Uh, this uh, uh, it's f minus 40 degrees in the winter, plus 40 in the summer. Uh, then uh, this this other contractor comes in uh, and says, "We're going to do this building with Norman Foster as the architect, and we're going to put it on your foundations." Uh, and somehow there was a deal made, and the president's office says, "Yes." Um, so then, uh, when we came to uh, the World Trade Center. Uh, Norman Foster had already designed a building for that site and he had finished the foundations and we got to put our building uh, on top <laughs> and it just felt uh, like poetic justice uh, <laughs> but uh, apart from that actually uh, when I started my, my office in 2001 uh, we won our first competition at the end of, no, uh, of August so uh, we were busy painting our first office space uh, on uh, September 11. Uh, and of course, I like, saw the the towers. Uh, we saw the second plane uh, hit, and it, we realized it was uh, terrorism. And then you realized that they actually collapsed. Uh, and of course, we never thought I never thought for a second that we would ever be involved in uh, uh, in, in, in building uh, uh, one of the towers. But uh, so so when it happened, uh, also it happened like what is it like 13 years after uh, the event. So. Um, it w we were quite clear that they had already opened the memorial, and in a way, the memorial was, it's like an eight acre park where the city commemorates what happened at 9-11, and there's the footprints of the two towers with the big fountains, there's the, 
the Memorial Center, this beautiful park. That's, that's where we remember what happened. And then in a way, the four towers that frame the memorial, where ours is going to be the second uh, one, um, that's where the city soldiers are, and New York is a, is a lively living city that, uh, uh, that keeps being a lively and uh, living city. So in that sense, we, we, we in a way deliberately took the memorial aspect out of our building and said, that's here, but what we have to do is become the dignified frame that frames the, the memorial. Um, but then, then an interesting thing happened. So we were tailoring it for like this uh, media headquarters. So there was like, uh, like uh, studios and newsrooms and sort of uh, uh, editorial floors and sort of more classic uh, towers. So because of the wedge shape of the site, the lower levels are like very long and slender, and then they get uh, shorter and wider. So on, on one and from one side it actually becomes bigger towards the top. And on the other side, it actually becomes more like a gigantic stair with, uh, with huge uh, parks uh, as you go up. And then uh, after we announced it, I got a letter a few days later from uh, a man uh, who's like, dear Mr. Ingalls, uh, my brother was one of the first responders that gave his life at 9-11 uh, with this uh, engine company. Uh, and uh, I just want to tell you that I really like your uh, design, uh, the new design for the, for the tower because I see it as uh, a giant stair uh, to heaven, uh, commemorating the heroic stair climb of the first responders and also the ascent to the heavens of the innocent souls that died in 9-11. So, um, so for him, he thought it was amazing that not only uh, the ground, but actually the skyline of the city of New York would commemorate the heroism and sacrifice of 9-11. Uh, and, and, and I responded sort of, I thought it was like a beautiful, uh, a beautiful sort of a, Symbolism that we had not thought about that at all, but now that he, uh, now that he said so, now I also uh, see it like that, uh, and I think it's like it's very it's very typical for uh, for public art, which architecture is, because like buildings are outdoor, they really become part of the city, and therefore they belong to everyone else. You know, of course, as architects, we put all of our ideas and our soul and our sort of uh, dreams and, and intentions into it. But once we, once we let go of it, then it becomes everybody else's, and their interpretation is as valid as uh, as mine. Uh, and uh, and in that sense, like now, of course, our tower is is a staircase to heaven, uh, just as much as it is all of the things we uh, we put into it. Well, uh, Bjarke, we're actually uh, running out of time, but I, I would like you conclusively to uh, short. Give one advice, your best advice, whatever advice, if you can say whatever you want, but to uh, the leaders of tomorrow, as Lars Lukas said, to our audience, what, what would be your best advice for them? Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, my favorite, uh, my favorite quote from, uh, from a ph philosopher, and maybe it's back to this idea, if it's something uh, you're born with or if it's something you're taught. Uh, I think uh, it's Schopenhauer. And... Uh, it, it translates poorly into, uh, into uh, English, but the English translation is you can do what you want, but you cannot will what you want. Uh, in Danish, it's more beautiful. It's man kan, man kan gøre, hvad man vil, men man kan ikke ville, hvad man vil. Uh, and I think the wisdom in it is that if you want something, you have, you have, the, uh, you have the ability uh, as a human being to act on it or not. I mean, of course, you, you, you might not succeed, but at least you have the ability to act on what you want or not. But what you can't is decide with your head what it is that you want, uh, you know, with your heart. And I think, uh, I, th I think in all aspects of life, if, if you become attentive to what it is that you really want, uh, instead of deciding with your head, it's, instead of willing what you want, to actually listen and really find out what it is you want, then you actually have the power to go ahead and, and do it. But as soon as you try imposing it uh, with a head as an abstract idea, or because you heard it, or because you thought so, or because you thought that was what I expected for you, then you're gonna end up uh, in trouble, and you're gonna end up uh, making, it, making it bad for yourself and everybody else. But if you, if, if you stay true to the truth, that, that you're born with, then 
then that is a, an, an amazing uh, power, uh, uh, um, and an amazing driver uh, to, to make a difference. Okay, we'll think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> So thank you, Bjarke, for a very interesting and inspiring presentation and for engaging us in your creative work. We have a sign of our gratitude for you, and thank you so much for coming here today. It's a optimist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just sign. And Vibeke, thank you for moderating this session. It is a great, ple a great pleasure to have you back at Or Symposium. It's always fun. Thank you. So this marks the end of your first session today. And um, just for information, track three will have their next session in the Jyske Bank Auditorium and track four in the TDC Group Auditorium. So thank you so much for your engagement on Slido and enjoy the break. <laughs>